Well, it's a week past Easter, and you know what that means? The Easter bunny is long gone, and so are those peeps and chocolates you blamed on the kids. Most of us have come out of our sugar comas by now, and the he is risen language has all but evaporated from society. So we're left asking ourselves, what do we do now? Well, if we look to scripture and follow the logical sequential order of the events that occurred, we get the book of Acts. So after the gospel, which documents the life of Christ, we get Luke, uh, who uh, continued his thoughts and thesis into the book of Acts, which documented the resurrected Christ's journey with the apostles and disciples, renewing and invigorating in them a hope that there is life after death, that there was a purpose to Christ's life after all, that he was the Messiah. He was who he said he was because he rolled away that stone and uh, presented himself to the world alive and well, offering us the same hope. If we believe, if we repent, if we join hands with the good citizenry of the kingdom of heaven and become a fruitful member of that society, we too have access to all the things that Christ offers. So what a despairing headline when we look at the church that fewer than ever are attending church. Millennials have done it again. Millennials killed church. How could you? So I think it's high time we look at the church and see exactly what's going on there with the plummeting numbers. U.S. church membership has fallen below the majority for the first time. In 2020, 47% of adults claimed to attend a church, synagogue, or mosque. So uh, well below the majority uh, attending any kind of organized religion. But why ever would the millennials be running from the church? Oh, this faithless generation, what have we done? Is it our fault that we raise kids that are so blasphemously ignorant of the good grace of God? I don't know. Uh, maybe they know something we don't. Let's explore, shall we? Just this week in Cologne, and not the kind you spray on yourself when you walk through Macy's for free, the Archdiocese of Cologne uh, expressed shock that the church uh, paid more than a million euros to clear the private debts of priests. Oh, what a shady thing to do. You know what's worse? They did it out of funds allocated to pay for sex abuse crimes. Sex abuse crimes? What? In the church? No, say it isn't so. Well, from 1950 to 2020, there have been 216,000 confirmed cases of sex abuse that they know about. Ready for this? That's just in France. 216,000. What happened to the old uh, idiom, if, uh, if we can save but just one, it's worth it, right? Am I right? 216,000 that we know about. And what's being done? Absolutely nothing. Well, who knew? Who could possibly know that this kind of stuff is going on? Maybe they just haven't figured it out at the top. Oh, well, let's take a look at the Vatican. Oh my goodness, what's going on in there? Former Pope Benedict admits to making false claims to child sex abuse inquiries. Huh, what? No. You're telling me the Pope has known the whole time that archbishops and bishops and priests are getting traded like baseball cards to whatever vacation spot church they wanna have so they can continue fondling kids? What? No, that's impossible. And what's worse is if you think maybe, oh gosh, if we just bring it to light and talk about this stuff, if we just, if we just let people know what's going on, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll understand that, that, that this is such an ungodly thing to do, that it looks nothing like the Christ that we see in scripture. And they'll, they'll have a, a sense of shame and guilt that will bring them to their knees and they will repent like Christ asks us to. Well, no, uh, child sex abuse in Catholic church was swept under the carpet in inquiry finds. A leader of the Church of England and Wales refusing to resign despite damning IICSA report. Pope Francis asked Cardinal Vincent Nichols, the leader of the Church of England uh, and Wales, uh, but he just wouldn't do it. Didn't really feel bad enough, I guess. Gosh, oh man. Well, maybe it's not that big of a deal to some. Maybe that's because they just don't see things the way that we do. I don't know. Um, I don't know how you feel about the war in Ukraine. I definitely feel like uh, the rape and pillage of women and children going on, the well-documented uh, massacre going on of Ukrainian civilians right now by the Russians uh, who are all but brainwashed by uh, a, a sicko uh, authoritarian uh, murderous dictator. Um, certainly the church would have an opinion on that. Well, the Russian Orthodox leader backs the war in, in Ukraine, not for the defenders, but for those committing the atrocities. This from the Washington Post article, whether warning about the external enemies attempting to divide the United People of Russia and Ukraine or very public blessing of the generals leading soldiers in the field, Patriarch Kirill has become one of the war's most prominent backers. 
His sermons echo, and in some cases, even supply the rhetoric that President Vladimir Putin has used to justify the assault on cities and civilians. Well, I mean, can you blame the millennials for the shrinking church numbers? I certainly can't. But, you know, really, at the end of the day, they are just making Jesus more correct, and I'll tell you why. He was speaking to a Samaritan woman at the well. They start talking about where she worships and, and, and asking which temple is the right one, uh, uh, the one near her in uh, Samaria or uh, the one in, in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and he says this, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He goes on to say, but a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. There was no animosity in the way he said it. There was rather an invitation, rather an, a, 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 a sense of excellence and praise directed towards those who would carry the spirit in their heart and make their, their bodies the living temple for the Holy Spirit. This union of man and the divine is the true ends at which God has been working tirelessly, tirelessly and died on the cross for. This is truly the message of hope that Easter brings. The call that Christ, the resurrected Christ placed on the apostles' lives was to carry that truth forward and to build communities of love that have something to hope for that we can grow together in that, that kind of image. And so the church started to spread and grow. A Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, started killing Christians, persecuting and killing Christians, hunting them down. And uh, on the road to Damascus, met the resurrected Christ in a, a blinding light. And uh, Jesus said, uh, why do you persecute me? Me. He said, me. Even though uh, Saul of Tarsus was chasing down Christians, more evidence that we are one body of believers when we're the church and that anybody that does harm to a member of the church is doing harm to Christ himself and vice versa. We are one. The church matters to Christ. He converted, Paul converted after that uh, and became one of the greatest of Christians, wrote most of the New Testament, has taught billions upon billions of the truth of who Christ is. He founded many churches in Ephesus, in Corinth, he traveled and, 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 and built people up. Uh, it, it coaxed them out of the pagan ways where they worship any god or uh, live with any carnal pleasure. Um, he, 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 he taught with love. He chastised some uh, who were polluting or poisoning the message of Christ with this sort of adulterated living, this, this sort of, I can have it all, I can, I can believe in anything I want to uh, way of thinking. No, brought clarity to that. And so the church grew from that place, grew from that place. And there's, there's something worthwhile to belonging to a body of believers that we can commit to in a loving way to refine ourselves and to build each other up, to find a safe haven from the poisonous rhetoric that the world provides, that we need certain things that are material to make us feel complete or whole. Where can we escape from that message for a moment with other believers while well, in the church? Oh, but what if the church has lost its way? Then what do we do? I know my mom probably absolutely hates the conversation we're having now. She's a devout Catholic, raised me in the Catholic Church. I left the Catholic Church when I was a young adult because I realized there were problems here that were not being dealt with and I could not participate in a religion or, or uh, an aspect of our faith that was leaving such a, a wake of destruction behind it and, uh, and, and nobody uh, bending down to help. Uh, I raised red flags. I, I, in fact, went door to door to churches to let them know about abuses that I had found out about in other parishes. And I was met with priests who were saying, you might wanna just let it go. Oh, I was wrecked. I left the Catholic Church. And here we are today with institutions of faith around the world grifting off of people, uh, preachers, pastors riding around on their private jets. Why have you said that you won't fly commercial? You said that it's like getting into a tube with a bunch of demons. Why do you think well, that? No, no, listen to me just saying. 
uh, advocating for b politicians that are antichrist archetypes and, uh, and, 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 and spewing false prophecies that don't come to pass. And he asked me who would win the 2020 election. And I told him a story, and the story was this. The media said, Joe Biden's president. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, one other Thank forecast. Uh, who wins in 2020? <laughs> Donald J. Trump. I was praying on Sunday saying, God, please tell me how it's going to happen. And I hope I've got the word. But first of all, I want to say without question, Trump is going to win the election. In Genesis, we see the serpent tempting Eve. His first order of business was to draw Eve into a conversation. Now we're just talking. He can do his work. And with that opening, he quickly sowed the seeds of doubt about God's truth. Doubt about God's truth. The devil's work can be summed up like this, according to David Guzik, who I love his commentary, Enduring Word. Satan wants us to see sin as something good that a bad God doesn't want us to have. His main lie to us is this, sin is not bad and God is not good. And while the church has epitomized that, its words certainly not matching its actions, which studies have shown is the number one reason uh, potential believers turn away from the faith. The church is making more atheists than anybody. I'm not advocating for relativism, there is truth to the word of God in scripture, and it is a compass and a guide. It can restrain us in healthy ways. And I think we need to understand what that is, to give a name to who God is, a specific target to what he's called us to. Righteous and obedience is important for our own health and for the health of others. So if you've been a victim of the church, if you've been abandoned or forgotten or excluded from the church, I invite you to open your heart to what God really has for you, which is a relationship that's one-on-one. -on -one. And maybe, just maybe, the next generation will have a place to collectively bow their heads together. Ha, 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 ha.